Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for this session. We pray that even as we are going into the study of your word, you will open the eyes of our understanding. Help us to understand your word. And we pray that this teaching will take us to another level in our work with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. We thank God. Um, we are on the third lesson under the course 103, 103 of uh, Todbury School of Ministry, which is from Eden to Pentecost. And so far, we have looked at God's eternal purpose. Then the second lesson was covenants. Covenants. And today we are looking at God's deal with Abraham. God's deal with Abraham. In other words, God's covenant with Abraham. Like we saw last week, um, there are there are three major deals that God has had with mankind. The entire human race. And the first major deal that God had with, an, with the whole of mankind was with Abraham. Because according to the terms of that covenant, through his deal with Abraham, all the families of the earth were going to be blessed. Um, no, the, 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 the first one was with Noah, sorry, Noah. And Noah's covenant was between God, Noah and his descendants, and then all living creatures. So it was a universal covenant. Then that of Abraham too was, in a sense, universal, in the sense that through his seed, all the families of the earth were going to be blessed. Then we have God's final and third deal, which was the new covenant, which was with our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, that was also with the entire humanity. That was the the, the best deal ever. And we are products of that deal, that covenant that God had with Jesus. You know, Jesus was the only man who could fully satisfy the terms of the covenant, who was fully obedient. All those that God cut the deal with, they were not, they were fallible. So, um, God used to call it my covenant, my covenant, you know, but with Jesus, he was the only person who could fulfill it to the letter. And so God cut the covenant with him on behalf of mankind. And that covenant is an everlasting covenant. And we are products of that covenant. The new creation is a product of the new covenant. We, our covenant is not with God directly. We are beneficiaries of God's covenant with Jesus. Now, today we are looking at God's covenant with Abraham. And Abraham is a very important figure in the Bible. In fact, um, he is a father of the called ones. Just as Adam is a father of the created ones, he is a father of the called ones. Now we see from Genesis chapter 3 that God was following a plan of salvation. When man fell, God's plan of salvation was unveiled. God's plan of salvation was not an afterthought. It wasn't secondary. It was, it was, it was established even before man was created. 
So it wasn't as if God quickly had to institute some measures to deal with the fall of man. No. Uh, he simply unveiled the plan of salvation, you know, when man fell. But the plan of salvation had always been in force, you know, it had always been in place. The Bible said that He even chose us from the foundation, before the foundation of the world. So, what happened in Eden where um, God killed an animal and used the blood of the animal to cover or to deal with the sin of Adam and Eve was, was a shadow. It was a shadow of what, I mean, what really was the plan of God. And because, you know, Adam tried to cover themselves. Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves with the, the, with fig leaves, but they were still found naked. Then God came on the scene. Then after punishing them, God also did something. He also killed an animal, used the coat of skin to cover Adam and Eve. That was, that was a shadow of God's plan of salvation. That it was going to come through blood, the perfect blood. The animal blood was just a shadow. And it happened in the Garden of Eden. It prefigured the coming of the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. So what happened in Eden was just a prefigure. It was just a shadow of what was going to take place years later when the full plan of God was going to be unveiled. Then God also promised that the seed of the woman was the one who was going to finally crush the head of the serpent. Even though the serpent is going to bite the heel, he will crush the head of the serpent. Now, the seed of the woman, as we all know, was a reference to Jesus Christ. You know, uh, a reference to the Lord Jesus, that he's the one who was going to come from the woman who was going to crush the head of the serpent. The reason why it was important that he, he came from the woman was that if you don't come through a woman, you have no legal rights of access into this world. So it was important. And God, God actually took time to explain that it was going to be the seed of the woman. We all know that the woman doesn't have the seed is the man that has the seed but god was saying that this one was going to be born by a woman only a woman without the help of a man so when god said that he put enmity between the devil and the woman and the devil and the seed of the woman so the devil was nervous so he tried to corrupt the human race so that the line through which the seed will come, that line will be corrupted. So he first of all instigated Cain to kill Abel, you know, so that, uh, because he knew that Cain could not produce that seed. That seed couldn't come from Cain, Cain's line. So, but it could come from Abel's line. So first of all, he had to eliminate Abel. So he killed Abel to stop God from implementing his, his plan. But God will not be stopped. So God also raised Seth in place of Abel. Then Seth, the Bible says that he was born after the exact likeness of Adam. And as a matter of fact, it was uh, out of Seth that the Messiah came. Not out of Abel, out of Seth, as uh, we all know. So it happened that after some time, you know, um, it got to a point when the devil was still after the line. He was still trying to corrupt the line so that they will not have the, the seed of the woman will not come. That is how Satan always uh, thinks. You know, he, he, he's somebody who always tries to deal with the thing from the source. If you are the one who is going to produce, produce the Messiah, then he will come after you and try to kill you so that everything will just cease. So later on, he, he also sought to corrupt the human line by allowing, um, um, you know, there was 
the, uh, the angels who came to have children with the daughters of men, all those things were attempts by the devil to corrupt the line, corrupt the, the, the human line, so that you, you cannot have the seed of the woman, you know, coming to crush the head of the serpent. The word head means authority. So one who will come and deal with the, with the serpent finally, you know, take the authority back from him. So in, in Noah's time, Satan also attempted to corrupt the line again. Uh, the, 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 the angels, fallen angels who saw the daughters of men and then came and then dwelt here, married them and all that. In, in Genesis chapter 6, we say, Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they brought children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Now these people, these giants were produced as a result of that unholy union between the, daughter, the daughters of men and the sons of God. And uh, it, it didn't happen only once because these these guys were wiped out by the flood but you, when you when you look through the bible you see that even after the flood they were giants after the flood it happened again you know um that is why uh, god said it over and over again that they should never marry the canaanite woman you know because we, if you trace you will see that um they were people who had been contaminated their line had been corrupted. So God, God did not tell the Israelites not to marry Gentiles. He was specific. He said, don't marry Canaanite women. That's why when Moses took a wife from Ethiopia and they were accusing Moses, they, they, they had missed the point. God wasn't against marrying somebody from, but he said he was specific. Don't marry the Canaanites because they were descendants of this child. And, uh, they were finally, um, dealt with in the time of um, 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 Joshua, and then um, um, their descendants were dealt with by David when he took Jerusalem, and then Caleb, when Caleb also went after them. But I'm not talking about them. Well, I want to say that then in Noah's time, Noah was the only one, his, his generation was the only one that was found perfect the word perfect is not talking about moral perfection. It's talking about physical perfection. Noah's line had not been corrupted. He didn't have that corruption, that mixture in his blood. So God decided to take Noah's line and then from Noah, I bring forth, because he was following his promise of producing the seed of the woman. And Satan had succeeded in corrupting all humanity. So God looked and then God saw that everyone was corrupt. Corrupt in the sense that they, they, they carried a mixture. You know. So it was only Noah. Noah and his generation who were not corrupt. So God called Noah. Noah had three sons. Um, Japheth. Then Shem. Then Ham. These were the three sons of Noah. So God called them. Then through them, the whole earth was repopulated after the flood. After the flood in Genesis 9, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. The same blessing he gave to Adam in Eden, he gave to Noah and his three sons. He put the fear of man upon the animals. And then he said, they should be fruitful and multiply and replenish because all humanity had been killed. Everybody was dead. So the only people who were surviving were these four people and their wives, making it eight people. And Noah, Noah's, Noah's three, three sons were supposed to give birth to repopulate 
the 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 earth. So out of these three, now everybody can can trace you can trace your lineage to one of these three. Everybody living on the surface of the earth now, you came out of these three people. Japheth, Shem, and Ham. Um I will I will talk about them. I'll talk about Japheth, Shem, and Ham for a while. But let me take you back a little bit. Now, you remember that in the Garden of Eden, um, there were three manner of trees in the Garden of Eden. I, I, I don't, this one was by way of introduction, but I'm, I'm going to deal with the, with God's deal with Abraham. I just wanted to give you a background. I'll continue with the Noah, the Japheth, Shem, and Ham. There are some interesting things that we can learn from their lives. But there were two trees in the midst of the garden, the tree of life and the, th- the tree of knowledge. As a matter of fact, knowledge of good and evil. So these were the two trees in the midst of the garden. Now, these two trees, they represent two Paths, paths, P A T H S, two or two ways represent two ways. You know, I've already spoken on that when you listen to the message I titled His Will versus I Will. You understand? So, this tree of knowledge, the devil, when Lucifer rebelled, he had charted a particular way of living, a particular path which is i will i will simply means self-government it means self-government it means self-centeredness self-centeredness which leads to self-effort that is i will is a part of declaration of independence from god which is always equal to death because god is life and if you declare independence from life, it means you will die. So, down throughout history, you will see that there have always been two groups of people, two groups of people. There have been people who have gone the way of the tree of life, which is the way of God-centeredness and God-dependence. And the tree of knowledge, which is the way of self-centeredness and self-dependence, is the way of I will. This this tree of life is the way of his will, his will, God's will. And this one is I will, my will, I will, I will, independence and uh, self-centeredness. You see from Genesis chapter 4, immediately you see Cain and Abel, and you see these two trees playing out in their lives. You see Abel depending on God. Abel came with blood sacrifice. He came with an animal to sacrifice to God. How did Abel get to know that God was looking for blood? It had to be by revelation. Otherwise, he couldn't have known. So, Abel depended on God to even know what to sacrifice. Because later in the Bible, there's a principle that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. So Abel got to know, and, and, and Hebrews says that by faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith means, uh, by thou says the Lord. Thou says the Lord. By following, thou says the Lord. You know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So by hearing from God, Abel was able to offer a more excellent sacrifice. Now he took animal and killed the animal. Then Cain also came. Cain came with the fruit of the ground, which represents his toil and his labor, which is self-effort, which comes from the tree of knowledge. So you can see why God rejected not only Cain, not only Cain's sacrifice, but Cain himself. God was reaffirming the fact that man can only be justified by that which comes from God, not that which comes from so that is the two paths that I want you to see. These two paths, 
if you trace them in the Bible, you will see that they go a long way right up to Revelation. And they become two cities. This, this tree of life, tree of knowledge, the his will, I will, God's way, man's way, they are versus each other throughout the Bible. And in Revelation, they, 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 they culminated into two cities, which I, I will talk about. One city was Babylon, one was uh, New Jerusalem. You will see that these two trees, you can trace them from Genesis to Revelation, and you can see them culminating in two major cities. You know, Mystery Babylon was built out of the efforts of man. Then, um, New Jerusalem was built by God coming down. I'm giving a background to why Abraham came in and how Abraham came in. So follow me. Now, when we came to the, the, the time of Noah, you could see these two trees clearly manifested. You see, uh, Noah's line was still the tree of life. They depended on God. All those who came through that line, they lead by that says the Lord. That says the Lord by faith. It's a faith line. That's the Lord. And then those who came through the tree of knowledge, that line, they live by natural instincts and they live by their natural human thinking, self-effort and self-centeredness. So in Noah's time, the tree of knowledge had ripened, had gotten to a point where man was so selfish. So there was lawlessness. Self-centeredness it is the fruit of the seed. The fruit of the seed of the tree of knowledge. In other words, the fruit of the tree of knowledge is self-centeredness and selfishness. And that led to wickedness and violence and lawlessness to the extent that God had to wipe out the entire human race. So, last week we realized that God did just that. He he killed everything that had breath, you know, with the exception of the fish in the sea. Those in the sea were, were not killed, but all the animals and all the human beings, everything was just destroyed by the flood. Now, after the flood, after the flood, man began to multiply again, you know, and, um, like I said, Noah's three sons were the people through whom all of us came. Now, when Cain rebelled against God, when Cain rebelled against God, and Adam and Eve sinned, and Cain also rebelled against God, the devil started a project. He started a project. And the project he started was a building project. A building project. Let's read Genesis 4, 16 to 17. Genesis 4, 16 to 17. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. This is what the devil wanted to do. The devil wanted to build an opposing kingdom. He wanted to build something that will oppose God. He wanted to build another Eden for man. He wanted to establish a kingdom in, in conjunction with fallen humanity. And that kingdom will thrive on the taste, the aspirations, and the the, the mentality of fallen humanity. That kingdom is what the Bible refers to as the world. The world. The cosmos. For The Greek is the cosmos. The world. Talking about the world system. The systems of this world. The systems. The cause of this world. The pattern of this world. All these things are various expressions given by the Bible. You know to illustrate what the devil wanted to build. He wanted to build a structure, a spiritual structure that would lead man away from God. So he was always trying to get them to build a city. 
and Cain was the first person who built a city after the fall, and he built it outside the presence of God. He said he went out from the presence of God, and then he built a city. Then he named the city after his son, Enoch. So they wanted to build, and uh, he, he, he built. He actually built. Now the Enoch here is not the Enoch who later walked with God and was not. This Enoch is the son of Cain. But the other one who walked with God and God took him was a descendant of Seth, not Cain. Um, this, the other one was the seventh from, from Adam in Seth's line. And this one was a third, was a third from Adam in, in, in Cain's line. You know, so the two Enochs are not the same. So let us not confuse. This one's different from the one. You know, the, the seventh person in Cain's line was Lamech. Lamech. He was the first person to practice polygamy, you know, in the world. So he's a Cain's system. The devil's system that he started was producing a lot of fruit. Cain was the first person to murder another human being in this world. Then his descendants were the first to introduce polygamy into the world. You see, so that was it. Then, um, Cain City was the first that man built, and it was built in opposition to God. When you read the verse um, 18 coming uh, from 19 to 22, you will see that Cain's line, they started inventing things. They started inventing things. They invented musical instruments, invented um, a lot of things, weapons of war to fight. They invented uh, dancing and singing and all that. A lot of things. Music, if you read um, Genesis 4, 19 to 22, uh, Lamech uh, took for himself two wives, Ada and Zila, and Ada bore Jubal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was his brother's name was Jubal. This one was Jabba. His brother's name was Jubal. His father of all those who play the harp and flute. And as for Zilla, she bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. So they were really uh, inventing things, you know. And Cain was the first president of that civilization. That city that he built, he was the one who was leading that city. And you can imagine a city that Cain is leading. It, it will be full of wickedness, <laughs> wickedness and every evil thing. No wonder it went, it went on till, um, it got to a point where people began to build a city for themselves and a tower whose height, whose top will reach into the heavens. They were all descendants of Cain. All those guys were descendants of Cain, you know, and they were doing that. And God had to also raise somebody from Seth's line, who was Abraham, to build, to build for him a contrary city, as we will see as we go along. So Cain, because Cain is of the devil, and so the city that Cain established was uh, full of wickedness and all that. So after the flood, the, the devil found a way to continue the building of the city. The building of the city, the city that Cain had started, he found a way. Now, the reason why he found a way was because, you know, all of Cain's descendants were wiped out before the flood. So after the flood, we only had Shem's, uh, uh, Seth's descendant, which is Noah and his three sons. But Satan managed to find a way of connecting them. So he found a way through one of uh, Noah's sons called Ham. You know, God had blessed them, but Satan found a way of introducing curse back into the human race. And it was through Ham. Because at that time, Cain's descendants were out, you know. But spiritually, the city that he built, the devil had not given up on the project that he was constructing the world or building a spiritual kingdom in opposition to God's kingdom. Because the I will must continue to its, its full end, its final conclusion. So Ham was the, the third born of Noah, the last born of Noah. And you know what happened? 
after the flood, Noah became, uh, he started planting, became a farmer. He was a farmer before the flood. A farmer, because he, the, the world farmers, in fact, when he was born, they said, oh, they gave him the name Noah because they said he was going to comfort them in their farming activities because the Lord had placed a curse on the world. Let's look at Genesis 5.29. I just want to give you a, a background so that when I get into Abraham, you can understand many things. And he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hand because of the ground which the Lord had cursed. So you see that that was the, 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 the reason why they called him Noah. And after the flood, he slipped back to farming. After the flood. You see, one thing is that when God gives you an assignment to do, and you finish your assignment, and you still hang around, you can easily mess up. Because you see, our lives, our lives, the relevance of our lives are tied to God's purpose. Outside of God's purpose, our lives are not relevant. So outside of God's purpose, you are likely to mess up. That is why Noah, you know, when God called him, he was a farmer. Then God said, build an ark. After building the ark and leaving that, uh, uh, those people for a long time, and then coming out of the ark, he went back to farming. That was when his problem started. Planted um, grape. You know, God drank from the grape. That was the first time the word drunkenness, I mean, drunkenness was seen in the Bible. You know, Satan wanted the way of introducing corruption. You see, wine, wine and uh, alcohol, uh, alcohol comes from fermentation. You see, and, and that is, that is a, a sign of corruption. You see, so Satan got him drunk, introduced drunkenness. Then in his drunken state, he got him to curse. The first curse that was released after the flood. Because after the flood, God only blessed, he didn't curse. He blessed them and said, be fruitful. But Satan managed to introduce a curse. Why? Because it was in that environment that he could get man to continue his building projects again. And it came because Noah was drunk. When you finish your assignment, you must pray that when you finish your assignment, you must leave. If you hang around, you can mess up. You see, David finished his assignment. David was somebody who was a fighter. He was called to fight battles. And not only that, when you neglect your assignment too, you are, all, you are also outside God's purpose and you are, you are, you are prone to danger. David was supposed to be in battle in, in 2 Samuel 11, 1. While Joab and the rest were out in battle, David was relaxing at home. That was when he was trapped by Bathsheba. And then he sinned against God. And he brought a lot of things into his life. When Solomon, Solomon was a builder, he was called to build. When he built the temple, finished, it, took, it took him seven years to build the temple. Then he went on to build his palace, 13 years, building his palace. So after 20 years of building, engaging, active building, and he was now idle, so to speak, he started building idol temples for his foreign wives. <laughs> because he was a builder, and nature abhors vacuum. Once he's a builder, he will, he will build. He was building foreign uh, temples, I mean, idol temples for his foreign wives. He, he married many foreign wives. King Ezekiel pleaded with God for 15 more years. He had finished his assignment. He had to go. He said, let me live for 15 more years. Then during the 15 years, he produced Manasseh, who was one of the most wicked kings Israel had ever had. One of the, he was the one who actually led, championed the worship of the queen of the coast and made cakes unto the king, queen of the heavens. Jeremiah, Jeremiah had a confrontation with him and it was a serious fight, you know, because he was a very wicked king. And King Ezekiel was a very righteous king. And the 15 extra years he produced Manasseh. So the safest place actually is in the will of God. 
the safest place is in the purpose of God. When you are in purpose, you are preserved. One thing I've realized is that, you see, when you, you are located in God's purpose, there's preservation that comes along with the location of um, being at the center of God's purpose. You are exempted from certain things because of the purpose of God. So, in the Bible, God deals with people like that. You see, for instance, David sinned against God. Then, God, uh, Absalom wanted to um, kill his father, David. God, I hate to fail to back him. They wanted to kill David, but God said, no, I won't let you kill him. I will punish David, but I will, not, I will still put him on the throne. Why? Because he was fulfilling the purpose. You know, God had anointed him as king and he was fulfilling a purpose. He was still fighting the Lord's battle. The reason why Saul was kept on the throne, even after, you know, Saul, Saul backslided when he was about two years into his reign. So for 38 years, Saul had been rejected by God. He was 40 years on the throne and he had been rejected by God. But God did not kill him or did not remove him from the throne. Why? Because he was still fighting the Lord's battles. You know, um, Aaron and Miriam spoke against Moses. God struck Miriam and left Aaron. Why? Because of the garment he was wearing. The high priestly garment. God couldn't, God deferred his judgment. So, not until Aaron was stripped of his garment, he couldn't die. When God wanted him to die, he said, go, go to the mountain with Moses. Carry Eliezer, your son. When you go, remove Aaron's garment and put it on Eliezer, his son, that he might die. Remove Aaron's garment that he might die. <laughs> so, God had to remove his garment before he was killed. So, there's something about being in God's purpose. It carries preservation. If you are in God's purpose, you are preserved. You are preserved. So, Noah was outside. He had finished his assignment and he was just relaxing. Then, the devil managed to introduce a curse back into the into the world. Now, what happened was that Noah was drunk and he was naked in his tent. Then, one of his sons, Ham, went and saw his father's nakedness. Then, the problem was not in seeing his father's nakedness. The problem was his inability to handle his father's nakedness. He went and broadcast the thing to his brothers. And he was making fun of his father. You know, and, and the father was naked, not in public, in his own tent. It was in his own tent, not in somebody's tent. He was lying in his tent. What is wrong with being naked in your tent? <laughs> I mean, it's your own tent. When you, when you enter the bathroom and you are naked, what is wrong with that? It's your own, your, or your bedroom, it's your own place. But he, he, he saw it and then he reported it. It's a lesson, you know, you, you, you should not be excited by your father's nakedness. You shouldn't be excited by your father's nakedness. So, because um, your father may be naked, but he may be in his own tent. So, when Noah got out from his stupor, he knew what had happened. Because Jaff Japhet and Shem took the cloth and went backwards and covered his father's nakedness. Their father's nakedness. How did Noah get to know that it was Ham? Because Ham, I don't know how he got to know that it was Ham who, who did the thing. Because after it was Japheth and Shem who came, but they came back with, you know. Then Noah got up and cursed Canaan. Now, Canaan was the last born of Ham. You see, he couldn't curse Ham because God had already blessed Ham. In Genesis 9, God said, uh, he blessed the sons of Noah and said, be fruitful and multiply. When, when God blesses, man cannot curse. So, Ham should have been the one who should have been cursed. 
Because he committed the act. But Noah saw that Ham couldn't be cursed. And the devil saw that Ham couldn't be cursed. So he directed the curse to Canaan, Noah's youngest child. Then through Canaan, the devil had access back into the, into the world. So you will see that Canaan's descendants, they were the Canaanites. They, they, they became so corrupt in the world. And it, it was like they, they, were, they, were, they did many, many bad things. Many, many bad things. So when you read Genesis chapter 10, it's a background to the call of Abraham. And actually, Genesis chapter 10 is more like in between 9 and then uh, in between 9 and 12. You know, uh, 10 was trying to give. If you look at the arrangement, you, you, may, you would think that maybe 10 should have come after 11. Uh, because, but 10 was just trying to go into details as to their descendants and the history descendants of, her, of, of Japheth, of Shem, and of Ham. Then 11, he centered on Ham's descendants. The sons of Ham, you know, they were the people who caused trouble. So let's look at their, their sons. Look at chapter 10. Now, this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Goma, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. Then he traced the sons of uh, Japheth to verse 5. Then verse 6. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim. You know, Mizraim is Egypt. Mizraim, Egypt. Cush. Mizraim, Put, or Foot, and Canaan. These are the sons of Ham. Okay, now um, it says that the sons of Cush were Ziba, Havila, Sapta, Rama, Saptika, <laughs> uh, and the sons of Rama were Ziba and Didan. Then he goes on to talk about Cush, who is one of the sons of Ham, Noah's son. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, they said like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kane, in the land of Shina. From that land he built, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ai, Kala, and reason between Nineveh and Kala, that's the principal city. So this was the land of, this was the uh, descendant of Cush, who was a son of Ham, the son of Noah. Then verse 13, Mizraim begot Ludim, and Anamim, Lehabim, Naphtuhim, Patrus, <laughs> Patrusim, and Kasluhim. <laughs> from whom came the Philistines and the and the captorim. <laughs> then verse 15 Canaan begot Sidon his firstborn and head the Jebusite the Amorite the Gigasite the Hevite the Archite the Sinite you see all these knights Ites, 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 Jebusites and all those guys who, who occupied the promised land they were descendants of Canaan that's why he said do not marry the Canaanite. Canaan was the one who received the curse. So Ham's, Ham's descendants, they were all bad. You know, they were, <laughs> they were all bad people. Ham's descendants. And bad, many bad people came out of Ham. Like this um, Nimrod. One of Ham's sons was Cush. Then Cush gave birth to Nimrod. Nimrod was somebody who was identified by the devil to continue his building project. He was the one who led the building of what we call the Tower of Babel. It was under Nimrod. And they say he was a mighty one. You see, when the, when the Bible says mighty one, you have a reference, you, have, you, you can link it to 
the giants, the giants that were in Genesis 6, he had some blood. He had such blood. He was a, a mighty, mighty one. Then he said he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And according to tradition, uh, Josephus, the historian, said that he was a hunter of man, not animals. He, he was a hunter of man. He was hunting human beings, not animals. And when he said he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, the phrase before the Lord actually means in opposition or in defiance of the Lord. Before the Lord, like you are there, somebody can stand before you. What is he doing? He's opposing you. So when God says, do not have any other gods before me, he was not saying that, oh, don't have them before you have me. No. He said, don't bring anything to stand face to face with me. I'm the Lord God. Don't have any other God before me. The same thing. So uh, Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. It was like he was, he was opposing God. He was a, 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 a symbol of rebellion against God. He had the spirit of king in him. And he was the one that the devil identified to continue his building project. So it's no wonder that in Genesis 11, verse 1, the Bible says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shina. You see, it was Shina that uh, Nimrod started his, his, his kingdom from, Shina. Then he said, and they dwelt them. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. You see that the, 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 you see the I will in them. The tree of knowledge. Look at what Cain did. Cain built a city and named the city Enoch after his son. And this one is saying, let's build a city. He said, let's build ourselves a city. That was the introduction of the I will. Satan had money to uh, introduce it through Noah, then to Ham, then to um, Ham's, Ham's son who was Cush. You see, Ham produced Cush and Canaan, you know, and Canaan was cursed. But Cush was not cursed, but Cush was the one who produced Nimrod, who became a figure of the Antichrist. He was a type of the Antichrist. A, a personification of the sin of man, which is rebellion. You see, the man of sin is a uh, an embodiment of the sin of man, which is rebellion. And Nimrod too was rebelling against God. That's why he said, let's build a city and a tower whose top, whose top will reach into the heavens. They, want, they were defying God. That Let God come and destroy us with a flood again. If he is God, let him come down and destroy us with a flood again. And they were defying God. Why is it that somebody is building a tower and it will attract God? If it is not something that was a statement against God, you see, he couldn't have attracted God like that because it was just a, 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 a city and a tower. But what they actually meant was that they would dedicate the top floor to the gods. And history has it that there was Nim, Nimrod had a queen called Smari, uh, 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 Sim, Sim, their names, Samaris. And this uh, queen, together with Nimrod, there was, there was this myth or this story that um, the, the, uh, um, uh, uh, they had, the, it was more like it, it, they had an uh, incarnate son, you know, uh, more like compared to Mary and Jesus, you know, Mary and Jesus, like. The, uh, the, the mother was an incarnate, you know, she, was, she came from the spirit, became flesh, and then she gave birth to a son who was also incarnate. That was, that was the thinking. 
and it led to the establishment of a religion which opposed God. So it wasn't only a city, it was actually a religion. You know, it was a spiritual building that Satan was building. And he was continuing from where Cain had started. Now, we have an imposing structure called the world. And it, the world is not only just religion. It, religion, commerce, a whole lot of ideas put together into this grand system called the world. But this is how the devil started it. I want you to get a background so that you know why God called Abraham. Why God called Abraham. You understand why God called Abraham. So, like I said, this Nimrod, and he was he was a dictator. He was a dictator, not like Noah, who had been appointed by God. He was a dictator because he was a mighty person. He came from um, Ham and then Cush. Then he established this religion, which was a cultic religion, which later on um, was 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 the one that was practiced by the Canaanites and God said the Israelites should never learn their, their practices making their children pass through fire offering sacrifice to gods you know burning cakes to the queen of the queen of the heavens before the queen of the heavens they believed that there was a there was a worship of a supreme father and then the queen of the heavens and the incarnate son so it, it was more like Satan wanted to copy he wanted to preempt, like, go before God to establish something like an unholy trinity. So that he, he will, he will, he will, because he had an idea that God said it's going to be by the seed of the woman. So he was doing everything possible to make sure that that thing will not come to pass. That was a religion. And they dedicated the top of the tower to the zodiac signs, you know, the zodiac and and all that they, it was worship of the elements that's that's the religion that has opposed god throughout the bible even the time of the kings you know when they let people into idol worship they, they will not only worship because Baal, you see Baal and asteroid and all those things they were gods they were gods and and they they, they were worshiping the queen of the of the of the heavens in Jeremiah's time they were doing that so they were worshiping the sun. In Ezekiel's time, they were worshiping the sun. They would turn their back to the temple like this. And they would be facing the sun. You know, as if they are in the outer court, but they are worshiping the sun. In Ezekiel 11, God said, God showed Ezekiel that this was the abomination of the elders of Israel. Worshiping the sun. God was against all that because they all came from this, this guy, uh, Nimrod, who established what the Bible calls mystery Babylon. Which later on in the Bible, in Revelation, mystery Babylon, the mother of all harlots. The, he became the mother of all harlots. Mystery Babylon. A very big, you know, grand <laughs> empire that Satan has established. So Nimrod instigated the building of the tower, the tower of Babel. And um, God came down and he destroyed, he confused them. And they, 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 they stopped building the city. But the Bible didn't say they stopped building the tower. They said it is left building the city. They didn't build the city. But I believe they built the tower. Now, now so when it happened like that, then God also introduced his building project and God's building project he wanted to use the line of Shem because when Noah cursed Ham at, at Canaan he blessed Shem then he said blessed be the Lord God of Shem then he said Japheth would dwell in the tent of Shem which means that Shem was blessed with a spiritual blessing. That the Lord God is the Lord God of Shem. That is why it was Shem's descendants who produced the Messiah, finally. 
this uh, Abraham came out of Shem. Let me let's look at uh, Genesis chapter eleven. Chapter eleven. Okay. Verse. Okay, no, chapter ten. The eleven one is eleven verse ten. And let, but let's look at chapter ten, verse twenty. Twenty-one. And children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eba, the brother of Japheth the elder. The sons of Shem were Elam, Asher, Avazad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram were Az, Hor, Geda, and Mash. Avazad begot Salah, and Salah begot Eba. Now, um, <laughs> Eba. Okay, 25. To Eba were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. For in his days the earth was divided. And his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan begot Almodad, Shelef, Hazamavet, Jera, Hadoram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimael, Sheba. Offer Havila and Jobab. All these were the sons of Jotan. Now I want to show you something here. Um, the Eba, the Eba, which was a descendant of Shem. That Eba, this one, uh, we are going a bit uh, into detail so that this is this is uh, Bible school so. We are we are studying the Bible. We are just studying the Bible. Uh -huh. So the Eba is a Hebrew word, which means cross over. That is where we got the word Hebrew from. Hebrew. So a Hebrew means a river crosser. River crosser. And it is, it is. Um, they were, they were the ones that Abraham. So Shem, this one came from Shem. They were the ones that Abraham descended from. You know, Abraham, because Abraham was the first person to be called a Hebrew in the Bible. And they crossed over from the other side of the Euphrates. They crossed over to the other side to the land of Canaan. And because he crossed over, he was called a river crosser. So the word Hebrew means river crosser. And Eba is Hebrew, the same word Hebrew. And so that's the root word. So Abraham descended out of Eba. He was a river crosser. That's why in Joshua chapter 24, Joshua chapter 24, um, Joshua said something. He said, your father, Abraham, his fathers, they were idol worshippers. Let's let's go to Joshua 24. I want, I, want, I want to show you something. Okay, Joshua chapter 24. Are you there? Okay. Let's read from verse 15. Joshua 24. So, Abraham was a river crosser. I will give you a scripture that shows that he was the first person to be called a Hebrew. Joshua 24. Okay, let me even read from verse 3. Okay, from, from verse 2. And Joshua said to all the people, That says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his de descendants and gave him Isaac. Now, so God took Abraham from the other side of the Euphrates, and he crossed over to the land of Canaan, 
and Abraham was that's why that, 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 that's, that's why he's called a Hebrew because the word Hebrew simply means uh, river river crosser now come to Genesis chapter 14 Genesis chapter 14 verse 13 Genesis 14 verse 13 I want to we are, we are talking about Abraham Genesis 14 13 the one who had escaped came and told Abraham the Hebrew for he dwelt by the terrible trees of Mamre the Amorites brother of Iscor and brother of Anne and they were allies with Abraham so Abraham Abraham at that time his name was Abraham the Abraham the Hebrew he was a Hebrew and the word Hebrew simply means river crosser and the, the word came from Eba who is the descendant of Shem so Abraham descended from Shem directly from Shem he was a river crosser that's, that's the meaning of the word Hebrew that is why well, people believe that Hebrew was the original language that God gave mankind to speak there's, not, there's nothing to prove from the Bible but they believe that Hebrew is God's original language you remember Jesus Christ when he met Paul when he met Paul uh, you know on the way to Damascus it was Hebrew that he spoke to Paul even though Paul could understand Greek he spoke also he chose to speak to Paul in Hebrew so people have, have concluded that Hebrew is the original language and if I hear the Hebrew language is very rich very very rich there are certain words that you know, they carry a lot of weight in the Hebrew Hebrew language but let me define for you uh, quickly a Hebrew is somebody who who crossed who has crossed over a Hebrew that is that is a Hebrew okay a, a river crosser it started with Abraham so Abraham was the first person to be called a Hebrew an Israelite is somebody who belongs to one of the 12 sons of Jacob so uh, their tribes so Abraham was not an Israelite he was he was Israel started with Jacob so he was only the, the tribes of Jacob the sons of Jacob who made Israel they were the Israelites then we have another word Jew a Jew is somebody from the tribe of Judah so um, a Jew is somebody who, who is from the tribe of Judah they are the Jews it got to a point in the history of Israel the entire nation that only the tribe of Judah remain the other 10 tribes they were scattered God just scattered them and they never came back from captivity but Judah went to captivity and God came back and God brought them back so those who live in Israel right now those who live there they are the Jews the descendants of Judah they are the only people there all the other 10 tribes they are lost and when you go to Israel they will tell you that we don't know even some of you may be our brothers we don't know you know because the ten tribes were scattered and they never came back from captivity you see then Samaritans are people who were born as a result of intermarriage between the Jews and Gentiles and they were Samaritans they were more like half caste and the Jews looked down on them that they were not pure breed they were mixed mixed have cast you see so the Jews look down the Samaritans okay so Abraham was a descendant of Shem Shem okay so it was against this background that God called Abraham God called Abraham God called Abraham that he might use him to 
also introduce his building project so what god promised abraham was a land he said get out of your father's house out of your family to a land i will show you so he promised abraham a land now when you go further in the bible you realize that god promised him a city not just a land but a city the land that god promised abraham land of canaan abraham didn't get even an inch of that land for free god promised god said, i've given the land to your descendant given it to you and his descendant, but he never even gave him a place enough to put his his feet the the land that the piece of land he got he had to buy to bury his wife sarah he bought that piece of land with money which means that the land god promised abraham was not really a physical land per se god was, wanted to use his deal with abraham to establish something in the spirit something bigger and deeper in the spirit which went beyond geographical uh, location which went beyond real estate or land it he wanted to use abraham's platform to build to establish a kingdom a spiritual system that will overpower the kingdom that the devil had started in the form of a city you know then eventually the seed of the woman will come and crush the head of the serpent so abraham's call was about god's purpose not his needs when God called Abraham, it was about God himself, not Abraham's needs. Even though Abraham had needs and his needs were met, God just met his needs. But God used his cooperation to establish the foundation for many things which were later to come. As you go along, you see most of the major things that we have now in the New Testament, they were birthed through the relationship between God and Abraham. That is what makes Abraham a unique person in the Bible. Because he gave God such a platform that no other person apart from Jesus was able to give God. He was the highest in the Old Testament, a friend of God. And he, through that friendship, he gave God the permission to do many things. And God also took advantage of that platform and he did many things in seed form in preparation for their fulfillment when Christ came. Christ couldn't have come if Abraham had not given God the platform. Because Christ's sacrifice was acted out in Abraham's life before Christ could come. Christ's resurrection was acted out in Abraham's life everything about the new testament was acted out in abraham's life before it, it came to pass so god called him from uh, of the callings you know as we when we were reading uh, genesis chapter 11 uh, chapter 10 verse 20 27 we saw a name there i just want to draw attention 29 the, the descendants of Shem, you know, there was, there was this name, Ofa, Havila, and Jobab. Jobab. That Jobab, they believe that Jobab was the one who wrote the book of Job. The Job that we, we, we know, he is Jobab, and he was Abraham's cousin, you see. So, um, uh, Bible scholars believe that he was the one who lost all his family. It was Jobab. Who is also called Job. That's why in Job, in Job, he said he was the greatest man in air. You see, in that place where Abraham, Abraham dwelt, air or as the same place where Abraham dwelt. And he, he, his book was the first to be written. The first book of the Bible to be written was the book of Job. The oldest book is the book of Job. So, we say that in the book of Job, they had reference to sons of God, meaning angels, sons of God. In Genesis 2, sons of God, many similarities. I just wanted to draw attention to them. 
But let's look at Abraham. So God called him out of Ur uh, from the other side. Then his father started a journey with him. The father got to a place and the father died. Actually, when you read the Bible, you, you, you will see that from Acts 7 verse 2, the call came to Abraham. Acts 7 verse 2, when Stephen was giving his account, he said, it was God who called Abraham. So, what, 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 what is the conclusion? God called Abraham. Abraham um, convinced the father to go with him. Then the father died along the way. He died along the way. He said, Acts 7 verse 2, and he said, Brethren and fathers, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants. You see, so when he came to the land of Canaan, God didn't even give him an inch of the land. Even though he said, I've, I've called you and I, I've given this land to you. He didn't give, because the thing was that it wasn't really the physical land that God was. Everything about Abraham's life should be looked at from two perspectives. All the physical things that took place in his life, there was a spiritual parallel. Every one of them. No wonder he had two descendants, natural seed, spiritual seed. Only Abraham had, God said, your descendants will be like the sun at the seashore, natural seed. Then the stars of heaven, spiritual seed. So, much as God was giving him a natural child, God was only giving him spiritual children. So, Abraham's life should be looked at on that, from that perspective. That everything that took place in his life had two parallels. The earthly parallel and the heavenly parallel. So, the land God promised Abraham, though it was a physical land, God did not give him even an inch to indicate that God's mind traveled further, further than the physical land. God was preparing a city for him. When we get to Hebrews you understand that it was a city that God was preparing for him. It wasn't just a land. Now let's look at Genesis 12. Look at Abraham's call, how he was called. Genesis 12. Verse 1. Now the Lord has said to Abraham, now not, not, notice that here he is Abraham, not Abraham. Get out of your country for your family and for your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, this is not the covenant God made with Abraham. This one was just a promise. I will, I will, I will. I will bless you. It's a promise. God was just making a promise to Abraham. Now, if, if, which means if, you, if you enter into a covenant with me, this is what I will do. I will, I will bless you. I will do. But at this point, there was no covenant. He had only responded to God's call. Come out of your father's house to a land I will show you. Then he got up and he was going. And God was giving him these promises. These promises. I will do this. I will do that. I will do that. It was just a promise. God started a new breed of creation through Abraham. He became the father of a new breed of people who were called by faith. Who were called and walked by faith. You see, God wanted to 
change man's connection from Adam. So Adam was the father of the created race, those who were created. But Abraham became the father of the called race. So Abraham became a platform, a foundation for the last Adam, who was Christ, who came also through Abraham. He made it possible for that dream of God to be realized. So God wanted to use his line to produce the Messiah. Not only that, but also because of God's special covenant with him, he was able to introduce his ideas concerning the kingdom in Abraham. The kingdom that he wanted to build. God wanted to introduce it to Abraham. You know, in, in Abraham. So that because of the friendship, God could implement all his plans through Abraham. When you read Hebrews 11, 12. Let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews 11, 12. You will see that Abraham's descendants. Hebrews 11, 12. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sun which is by the seashore. These are the two seeds of Abraham, natural seed and spiritual seed. Both came out of Abraham. So you, you can understand why I said he's a father of the called race. The called race. That's the spiritual seed. The natural seed is the Jews, the people of Israel, but the spiritual seed are the believers. So we are also sons of Abraham. We are sons of Abraham. The Genesis chapter 12, they are not the, the it's that's not the covenant God made with Abraham. It's not the covenant. And also we usually hear people talk about the blessings of Abraham. Blessings of Abraham. But there is nothing in the Bible like the blessings of Abraham. Hello. Hello. Abraham. Only one thing. Let's open to Galatians 3:14. Galatians 3:14. That should tell us that all the material blessings that he had, they were actually shadows of one spiritual blessing that God wanted to introduce to all humanity through Abraham. Galatians 3:14. It says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The blessing of Abraham was the Holy Spirit living in mankind. You know, and that is the ultimate blessing. All that God was doing, it was to accomplish something all those plans the full right so in Abraham you will see certain pictures of the plans of God in Abraham you will see that it is clearly displayed in the life of Abraham these three people Abraham Isaac and Jacob God said I will be known by these three 
throughout all generations. My name shall be God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. Now, the reason is that these three, especially starting with Abraham, all, all three of them, they represented God in different dimensions and different attributes. And they, God used their lives to lay a platform, a platform to implement his ideas. For instance, Abraham's life, Abraham's life portrays the father's search for sons. Abraham's life. It portrays the father's search for sons. You see, God's heart desire is for sons. Then Isaac's life portrays the son's search for a bride. So the father is looking for sons. The son is looking for a bride. Then Jacob also portrays the spirit search for habitation or a temple habitation. So the father is looking for sons, a family of sons. The son is looking for a bride. And the spirit is looking for habitation. If you look at it from this context, you can trace it throughout the Bible and see the various uh, fulfillments. Um, if you were here when we were doing um, the church, well, at the, at the school of ministry, when we, we talk about the church, I took my time to explain and to trace them from Genesis right to its conclusion. So we see it in Abraham's life. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God said, "Through," He said, uh, "Throughout all generations, I will be known as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob." Now let's get into what Abraham's life accomplished for God. What Abraham's life accomplished for God, and we will, we will look at Romans chapter four, verse one. Romans 4 verse 1. Romans chapter 4 verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? God's covenant with Abraham was a foundation of all future covenants. And out of it sprang the new covenant. The new covenant which gave birth to the new creation. We are products of the new covenant. And the new covenant came out of Abraham's covenant. It it was made possible because of Abraham's covenant with God. And that we are products of of the new covenant. Now, the whole Bible, like I always say, from Genesis 12 to the end, is about Abraham's vision and Abraham's work with God. Genesis 12 to Revelation 22, you will see that everything is about what God told Abraham and how it got fulfilled. What God told Abraham and how it got fulfilled. That's every summarize everything in the Bible. So he says. What has Abraham found according to the flesh? What did Abraham get in the flesh, get in in the physical, in the body, which was speaking of a spiritual truth? He became the father of all those who believe. Galatians 3, 7 to 9. He said, all those who have faith, they have become the father, and Abraham is their father. They are sons of faithful Abraham. He has become their father. Now, the issue is that when Adam sinned, I'm I'm, I'm going going to show you how Abraham contributed to the new creation, resurrection from the dead, how we we see all those things in the life of Abraham. Abraham is a unique person in the Old Testament. According to Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, when Adam sinned, God said, you are dust. And unto dust shall you return. That was what God told Adam after Adam had sinned. 
So Adam's nature after he sinned was he was what? Dust. His nature was dust. Then in Genesis 3 14, God had already told the serpent that your food shall be what? Dust. So God placed fallen man in the mouth of the devil. That's why the devil has a right over fallen man. He has a right to put anything on you, put um, sickness in your body, put anything, fallen man, because man, fallen man is dust and the devil, the serpent's food is dust. I hope you remember those scriptures. So, even when Abraham met God, Abraham also acknowledged that he was dust. You know, he acknowledged, he said it once, he said it once, um, that he was dust. But I'm not going into that. When, when, um, God, he, he, he was pleading with God for Sodom, he said, I'm, I'm dust. But he added another component. He said, I am dust and ash. Dust and ash. Now, ash stands for repentance. So, at that time, he was not dust, but he was referring to his human nature that he's dust, not only dust, ash. Genesis eighteen twenty seven. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed now, I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. So now, uh, Adam was dust. dust. That's why anything that is dust, 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 is natural canal, natural canal, natural canal. So if you have dreams that you are you're doing something in the dust, Mean that you are entering into carnality or natural issues. But Abraham said dust and ash. Dust plus ash. When the dust repents, that is dust plus ash. So, that is man's nature. But God wanted to raise a new breed over whom the serpent had no power. So, their nature will not be dust, but the new breed of people that God wanted to raise, their nature will be rock, not dust. Rock. And he laid the foundation in Abraham. As we go, we will see. He laid the new creation, the resurrection from the dead, and everlasting life. He laid that foundation in seed form in Abraham. Because Abraham moved from dust to rock. He moved from dust to to rock. When God entered the covenant with, into a covenant with Abraham, God changed his name from Abram. Abram. And then Sarai. Sarai to Abraham. Abraham. And then Sarah. And like I said at that time, God exchanged, you know, it was, it was a covenant he had with them. You see, God's name is this, Yahweh. Yahweh. Yahweh is spelled H-Y-H-W-H. The, 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 the Hebrew alphabet doesn't have vowels, only consonants. The English, we add A and then E and it becomes Yahweh. But the Hebrew is Y H W H. So when, if you do, uh, is it permutation or combination? You realize that there are two. This God, God, Abraham, Abraham, Abraham had no H. Abraham had no H. You see, Sarai had no H. But this one, Abraham, had one age. Sarah had another age. It means that God, God is showing that God, God entered into a covenant with them. You know. Now, that was something significant. Because when God changed their name, their bodies also changed. 
not only their bodies, their nature changed. Their nature changed. Abraham's body, Bible says, his body was dead. 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 It says Abraham's body was what? Dead. But when God changed his name, life came out of death. His body came alive. Come to Romans 4.19. Romans 4.19. Romans 4.19. Talking about Abraham. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So Abraham's body was dead. Okay. So Abraham's body was dead. Abraham, dead. Sarah, dead. They were all dead. Their bodies were dead. When their bodies were dead and God entered into a covenant with them, when Abraham believed God, an element was released. That element is called righteousness. Righteousness. Now you have to follow me carefully, otherwise you you will lose me. The same Romans chapter 4 verse 3, it says, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So when he believed God, righteousness was released. I'm trying to explain to you how he moved from death to life. Righteousness was released. What can righteousness do? Come to Proverbs chapter 10. You see, the Bible is an inspired book. And scripture interprets itself. Proverbs 10 verse 12. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 2. Verse 2. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivers from death. Righteousness delivers from death. Now, Another scripture, Proverbs 11, verse 4. Proverbs 11, verse 4. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. So when Abraham believed God and righteousness was released, the righteousness stopped the death process that was in Abraham's body. And his body started, his body was put on the path of life. Hello. That's why God said, I will come back to you according to the time of life. Not the time of death. Time of life. And Sarah, your your wife, shall embrace her son. Why? Because of righteousness that was released as a result of his faith. It stopped the death process and brought life to his body. That was a picture of the new birth. That as you believe in Christ, righteousness is also imputed to you and it stops the death process and then the new creation is released. So, Abra- But Abraham's nature was actually changed to rock. Come to Isaiah 51 verse 1 and 2. Abraham's nature was changed from dust to rock. And it was in a seed form because the Messiah was still yet to come. But it gave him the platform to implement all that. He says, listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you, for I called him alone. And blessed him and increased him. He said, look to the rock from which you were hewn. And then the rock he was referring to was who? Abraham. So now, Abraham is referred to as rock. Not dust. So Abraham's nature has changed. 
from rock to dust. The serpent can bite the dust, but no serpent can bite the rock. In fact, those who belong to the rock, they shall pick up serpent. He said, those who believe, and it is those who believe who are descendants of Abraham, the spiritual seed. And so those who believe, like Abraham, they have passed from dust to rock, and so they shall pick up serpents, and they will not harm them. He said the Bible is really, really inspired. It's an inspired book. That's why, you see, Paul, a serpent, fasting itself onto Paul's hand. The Bible says he shook it into the fire and, and suffered no harm. That was a picture of a rock which cannot be beaten by a serpent. So, if you are born again, it's not just that your sins have been forgiven. Even Abraham in the Old Testament experienced this transition from dust to rock to the extent that the serpent didn't have power. Death, the cycle of death was broken over Abraham. And life came out of death before Isaac was produced. Because his body was dead, he couldn't produce. Now, when the Bible said the body was dead, it doesn't mean that physically his body was dead. Because it was out of that deadness that he produced Ishmael. When he gave birth to Ishmael, he was, um, I think he was 86. 86 years. Yes. And Isaac he was 100 years. So if 86, and if after Isaac he was able to produce with Keturah seven sons. So you see, the deadness was not limited to the physical body, but it was talking about Abraham's nature. So from dust to rock, his nature was changed. And he laid a foundation for the Messiah to come and for the Messiah to walk in that covenant and establish a new covenant with God. All because of Abraham's obedience. Abraham's work with God. So when Jesus Christ came, Jesus, obviously, we all know that he's rock. Jesus is rock. We all know that he is rock. He is rock. Now, rock actually is that which proceeds out of God. I will build my church upon this rock, this revelation, this decree of God, this word of God. You see, and Jesus Christ is rock. He is rock. When Jesus came and he died, they did not put his body in a mere tomb. They put his body in a tomb that had been hewn out of a rock. Uh, Matthew 27 verse 60. So I believe that what Abraham did, what God did in Abraham contributed to the body that was being prepared for Jesus. A body you have prepared for me. I have come to do your will, O oh God, in the volume of the books as it's written of me. Matthew 27, verse 60. It says, And laid, verse 59, When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. They couldn't have put him anywhere. They had to put him where the tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Why? Because he was, he was coming from Abraham's covenant, Abraham's line. And Abraham has already set the tone, set the pace, erected the platform of life. So they put him in it. And the tomb was, nobody had been laid in that tomb before. It was brand new. And it had been hewn out from the rock. So we see the new birth. We see the seed of the new birth in Abraham. The seed of resurrection from the dead in Abraham. If what, what God did in Abraham's life, I'm telling you, you see, it, 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 it was something that God laid down in the spirit and he picked up on it later on. It, that's what God does. You know, like for instance, you know, Enoch never died. Uh, Elijah never died. God took him, you know, to heaven. He never died. Now, you know why? Because later in the Bible, 
the spirit of Elijah came back. He said, he shall go in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Talking about John the Baptist. So, the reason why God ne- he, he never died was that God used that thing. You know, it was a spiritual thing. God took that thing again and put it on John the Baptist. He never died. Because the spirit of Elijah came to rest on John the Baptist. Because that thing had been, the seed had been prepared already. The same thing with Abraham and Jesus. So we see the resurrection from the dead in, in the life of Abraham. There are many things that Abraham's life typified. Many things. Many things. One of them was Christ's sacrifice on the cross. The reason why God was able to give his son was because Abraham gave his son. Because they were in covenant and the covenant was a blood covenant. And the blood covenant was that whatever is yours is mine. Whatever is mine is yours. If I demand anything, you have no right to refuse me because we are in blood covenant. And God had cut a covenant with Abraham using animals and animal blood. And God himself had come to pass through the animal pieces. Genesis 15. And cut a covenant with Abraham. So God's relationship with Abraham was not just like the, the one he had with other people where he called them. No, no. It was God subjected himself to the terms of the covenant. That if I break my part, let me, God, die. Because that was how covenants were cut in those days. And if God cannot die, it means that God can never break his part. So, Abraham's life, that's why Bible singles him out as Abraham, a friend of God. It got to a point, God couldn't even hide anything from him. So, I from Abraham what I'm about to do. I can't hide from Abraham because now I'm his covenant brother. God came down in the likeness of man to eat food prepared by Abraham. And he sat under his tree. Abraham prepared cheese and, 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 and meat. And God was eating Abraham's food. Can you imagine? I mean, he was a special friend. You have never seen it before. That God was eating his food. I mean, look at somebody who Melchizedek would just appear to him and give him bread and wine. You see, for God to, if if you have a, a dream or a vision, and God comes to you, and you, you see God freely, freely, and you know God is giving you something. It's 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 a higher something. It's not like a. Moses was also close to God, but Moses didn't experience what Abraham experienced. Moses saw God's similitude face to face and could talk with him. But Abraham, God came in the flesh. The word became flesh in Abraham's life. Ate with Abraham. <laughs> he said, that which we have seen, our hands have handled. He touched God like that. I mean, he met Melchizedek, talked face to face, body to body, not a vision, not a dream. It was because of the special role Abraham played in the things of God. So when God said, give me Isaac, your only son, and look at how God put it, give me Isaac, your only son. Even though Ishmael was there, he said, your only son. (laughs) Because God did not acknowledge Ishmael. Ishmael was born by Abram. Abram. But Isaac was born by Abraham. For Isaac, he had changed his name and therefore changed his body, changed his nature before Isaac was produced. So he said, Isaac is your only son. Give him to me. Abraham couldn't have refused God. Why? You just cut a covenant with God which means that Whatever you have is mine. I can just walk into your room and take anything. You can't stop me. So, Abraham had to offer Isaac. And according to the Bible, Isaac was offered up. According to the Bible, Isaac was actually sacrificed. We see in Genesis chapter 22 that Abraham didn't kill Isaac. But in the spiritual sense, before the court of the universe, 
it is written and recorded and Abraham offered up Isaac. So when Isaac was brought back, according to God, Isaac was brought back from the dead because he died. Let's read uh, Hebrews 11. To God, you see, to God, it's, it's not really the act. God, it's not really the act. God doesn't mark you by the act. He marks you by the heart. For instance, if God says do something, he, he, he even starts blessing you before the thing is done. Why? Because he, he has already marked you. Your, your, heart, your, your heart has already done the thing. Before it came in the physical, you have accepted it. And that's all that he wants. Genesis, uh, Hebrews 11, verse... Um, um, okay. Let's read for verse 14. No. 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Have you seen? Offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So, you see what Paul is saying, the Bible is saying that Abraham offered up Isaac and then he received Isaac back from the dead in figurative sense. In the sight of God, Isaac was offered up. And so, when God said, Abraham, do not lay your hand to the child and God provided a, 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 a ram. God and, and Isaac was restored to him. It was a picture of the resurrection. By that act, God had accomplished the resurrection of Christ. So it means that Christ could also be given and could also be brought back from the dead. Because what is happening between me and Abraham if Abraham has done it, then I too can do it. So when God saw that Abraham had given his son, God too said, me too, I will give my son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It was be- possible because of what Abraham did. Because they were in a covenant. When they got to the mountain, you see, when, when they were going to the mountain, um, Isaac had to carry his own wood the wood that he was supposed to be, that was, was supposed to be put on to be killed, he was carrying the wood. So he said, Father, this is the wood. Um, this is the, this is, where is, the, where is the, the, the sheep? Then Abraham said, the Lord will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. God will produce himself as a lamb for the burnt offering. So Isaac carried his own wood. Jesus carried his own cross. The cross that was to be used to kill him, he, he bore it. Just as Isaac also bore his own wood. So that God was doing everything. And another, another thing that is even exciting is that the very place where Abraham offered Isaac, that place was a place called Moriah. And Moriah had about five mountains in that region. One of them was Calvary, later on called Calvary. And so it is believed that it could be the same place where Abraham offered Isaac. It could be the same place where God offered Jesus. Mount Moriah. Actually, that was the same place where Solomon built the temple. When you check Genesis 22, 1-2, and Second Chronicles 3 verse 1, you see that Solomon's temple was built on Mount Moriah. The exact place where Abraham offered Isaac. There was something unique about that thing. What, what, what happened on, on that mountain was so unique. It was a public statement. And the devil knew that he had lost the battle. Because as soon as it happened like that, God said, oh, then I can also bring my son. My son can also come, die, and come back. I will receive him back. Like Abraham offered Isaac 
Isaac died and he received him back in a figurative sense. Abraham's life also you can also see various aspects of the church in Abraham's life. The first one is the first place he built an altar was Bethel. Genesis 12 verse 8. Then it was this same Bethel in Genesis 28 verse 18 to 22 that Jacob had an encounter with God. And Jacob said, this is none other than the gates of heaven. This is the house of God. And he named the place Bethel. The same place Abraham built an altar. The same place Jacob encountered God. And that was when the church was born in a seed form. So I said, Jacob's life typifies the search of the spirit for habitation. He was the first person to talk about the church in that sense. He said, this is a house of God. He took a pillar, then he, he poured oil on the pillar and said, this is a church. Later on, Paul said, the church is the house of God, the ground and the pillar of the truth. The same pillar Jacob erected thousands of years ago was what the seed form of the church that God established. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see. So, Abraham's covenant with God was a very broad covenant encompassing a lot of things. A lot of, his work with God was unique laid the platform for many things that God later did. Many years later. Now the second thing is about the promised land. The promised land. The land that God promised Abraham. It was a city that God promised Abraham. Not only a land. The land was just on the physical plane. But the spiritual, you know, I've said that you look at his life from two uh, from this perspective, the spiritual and the physical. So the land, that's why God didn't give him even an inch on that land. But later, later, God gave the land to his descendant. But the actual land God promised him was a city. In Hebrews 11 verse 14, it says, For those who, okay, verse 13, these all died in faith. Talking about Abraham, Sarah, Jacob, and other Isaac. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. He has prepared a city for them. Look at verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to, a, to the place which he will receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in a land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So Abraham was looking for a city. When he got to Canaan, he said, no, 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 this this can be God, God's promise. He said, if they had called to mind where they came from, they would have had an opportunity to return. Because Abraham was not poor when God called him. He was rich. He had cattle, even though God also blessed him, but he was not a poor person. And where he was living was not a bad, a bad place per se. When he got to Canaan, he saw that this, this place has nothing, 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 nothing like, doesn't really look like what God has promised me. He has nothing. He said, this can be what God has promised me. He said, he was looking for a city which has foundations, 
whose builder and maker is God. Talking about the new Jerusalem. That was what God promised Abraham. When he says, get out of the land I will show you. Physically, it was the land of Canaan. But you see, his life was both physical and spiritual. And God was, God, that was when God introduced the city in, in contrast with the city that Nimrod had built. That Satan was building. God said, I will give you to a city. So you trace it from Genesis 22. You come to Revelation 21. It says, and I saw the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. That was the city that God promised Abraham. Say, they designed a heavenly country, a city whose builder and maker was God. So you see, Abraham's life typified many things. And that city, that city is called Zion. Zion. So we have two cities, Babel or Babylon. Babel or Babylon. Zion or Jerusalem. Two cities. And Zion, Zion is the same as Jerusalem. When you read uh, Psalm 76 verse 1 and 2, it talks about Salem. Salem is Jerusalem. And Zion, they are used interchangeably. Like I've already explained that it's like talking about Atria, and the uh, Abeswa. You can refer to the mountain as Atria. You can refer to the place as Atria. The town is Abeswa, but the mountain is Atria. And the, they are used interchangeably. The same thing with Zion and Jerusalem. When you say Zion, you are talking about Jerusalem. Because Zion is the mountain that surrounds Jerusalem. It's a stronghold. And Jerusalem is a city. Now, do you, you know when Abraham actually tapped into this city. It was when he paid tithe to Melchizedek. You see, Melchizedek was the king of Salem. The king of Salem. King of Salem means king of Jerusalem. King of peace. Salem means peace. Jerusalem means city of peace. So Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek. And he was king of Salem. King of Salem. Which is king of peace. And then king of righteousness. His name means Melchizedek means um, just king. King of righteousness. And then he was also king of Salem. Which is king of Jerusalem. Zion. That was when Abraham tapped into that thing, he only paid tithe to Melchizedek. That is why, even though we are, God made the tithe as a law for the Old Testament people, and he gave them many other dimensions of the law, you know, and all those dimensions, all the cases going with tithe, doesn't affect us as New Testament believers, but when you pay tithe, you actually tap into this kind of anointing because you actually covenant with God to ensure what is yours. If it's a business, you insure the business. You know, we do insurance against theft, against burglary, against fire, against all that. You insure the business if you pay tight. You insure yourself if you pay tight. If you don't pay, you are not cursed. But if you pay, you are blessed. (laughs) <laughs> you are blessed. You tap into that Melchizedek anointing. Yeah. So, that's how Abraham was able to take part. God made sure that he brought Melchizedek in Abraham's way. So, Abraham would tie to him. By that act, God connected him to the city, New Jerusalem. So, in Revelation, we have two cities, the mystery Babylon and the New Jerusalem. And the new Jerusalem actually is referring to believers. Come to Revelation chapter 21. 
So, we have been saying that we are the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. But look at Revelation 21 verse 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, now, here you will not see it well. Come to chapter 19, verse chapter 19. Mm-hmm. Okay. Verse uh, 7. Let us be glad. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is a righteous act of the saints. So here you see that the wife is is referring to the saints. But here, 21, it says, the wife is the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Verse 20, 21 verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last place came to me and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also she had a great and high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of Israel, three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations and on them were the twelve, the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. What he's talking about here, he's talking about the church. He's talking about, actually talking about Christians, about not Christians, saints. All saints, all those who have worked with God, all those who belong to the, the, the called race of faith. They are the ones who come together to form the bride, the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And he's saying that they have 12, 12 gates who stand for the 12 tribe of Israel, then 12 foundations and the names of the two apostles are there now you see that the church in the old testament and the church in the new testament coming together to become the heavenly jerusalem so 12 12 24 elders around the throne revelation is a book of symbolism so what god promised abraham was this thing that you are going to be the father of the called race. Everybody who will believe, who will work by faith, they will all come through you. So everybody from Abel, who even came before Abraham, to the last person who will respond to God by faith, he is in Abraham's bosom. Now, when they died, they went to a place called Abraham's bosom. Why Abraham? Because Abraham has become the father. God has changed our root from Adam to Abraham. From the created race to the called race. And Abraham has become our father. And that is the city that God said he was going to build. And if you are born again, you are part of that city. Which was built through the obedience of Abraham. Now, the last one is this. I've said it before, but let me say it again. The fivefold ministry was also birthed in Abraham's life. It was typified in Abraham's life. You see the fivefold ministry. Because you see, Abraham was more like if God used his friendship to establish many things in seed form. He was an apostle because he was sent, commissioned. God called me and said, come out of your father's house. Let me send you out. Let me To a land I will show you. He went out. 
That's an apostolic commission. Then he was a prophet because God said so. In fact, he was the first person to be called prophet in the Bible. Genesis 20 verse 7. He said, restore the man's wife to him and he shall pray for you for he is a prophet. He was an evangelist. You see the office of the evangelist in Abraham's life when he went out to rescue Lot and his people, Genesis 14, 13 to 16, he went out to rescue Lot and his people from oppression. That was an evangelist in action. He was a pastor. He had equipped 318 servants in his own house. The servant, the, his servants gave birth to children and they had grown in his own house and Abraham had trained them, equipped them. That's a pastor. 318 servants. He didn't he didn't need any external army. He trained them in his own house. And when it was time for war, he just um, marshaled them to war. Then he was a teacher because God said so. In Genesis 18, 19, God said, For I have known him that he may instruct, instruct, command his household after me. He was a teacher. So you see, the fivefold ministry all being birthed in Abraham. Another one is the royal priesthood was introduced to Abraham when he met Melchizedek. The royal priesthood was introduced to him. When he paid tithe to him, he had the privilege of giving birth to the royal priesthood. And truly, truly, Jesus Christ came through that covenant. Then he established the royal priesthood. He was the first to partake of the communion, bread and wine. So you can see that Abraham is not a joke. Melchizedek gave him bread and wine, which he took. You know, that was a picture of the communion. So what has Abraham, our father, found after the flesh? He gave God permission to establish his will, the church, and all his plans. So, God was so much at peace. After he dealt, he, he cut this deal with Abraham, everything was now set. God could look through the generations and see all his plans fulfilled. There was no threat anymore. Now the Messiah can come the church can be established. The, 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 um, the resurrection can come. The new creation can come. Why? Because I've accomplished all in Abraham's life in seed form because of the covenant I have with Abraham. Amen. Okay. If you have any questions, you can ask them. If there are any questions, you can ask them. We have we have come to the end of the lesson, so it's time for questions. If there are any, Okay, um, no, you see, the thing is, if it is a spiritual consequence, let me, let me approach it from this point. Um, the penalty of sin that man committed, when we repent and believe in Jesus, we don't suffer that penalty of sin. It has been dealt with. Yeah. And also, when we sin our normal sin, you see, every act, action has consequence. Maybe, um, you have you have gone to maybe steal um, 
something. Okay. Then they catch you. Then they beat you till you die. <laughs> now, now, yeah, when they caught you, maybe you, you, you pleaded with God that God should forgive you. God has forgiven you. But it doesn't mean that they will not beat you. That one is a, that one is a physical consequence. They will beat you. <laughs> it's like you can, um, you can take money and tear the money into pieces. But it's your own money, but it's illegal to do that. It's your own money. But it's illegal. So you have, it's got to do with not only you, but also the government. You understand? Uh, so this, this, these are actions, cause and effect. Like the, the, what you sow, you will reap. That one has not, nothing to do with whether God has forgiven you. God will forgive you. Uh, I know, I've, I know two cases of people who, when they were single, they went as a people's husbands. When they were students, in fact, they were students, tertiary students, and they went after people's husbands. <laughs> so, when they got married, they became born again. It happened; the same thing happened to them. You know, people, other people came for their husbands. <laughs> so that's why you cannot say that once you, oh, what you sow, you will reap. Uh-huh. It, it, it's, not, it's not God who is punishing them. All. It's a principle that what you sow, you are going to reap. If you don't want to reap, then you must do something about it. Maybe I think we can change. <laughs> are you okay with it? Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, it's God who cut the covenant with Abraham. In fact, throughout the Old Testament, it was God who initiated the covenants. The, the one with Noah, he said, my covenant. The one with Abraham, he said, my covenant. But you see, you can have a kind of relationship with God which becomes covenantal. And God also respects that relationship. It becomes a covenant between you and God. And you know it's a covenant. He also knows it's a covenant. You know, uh, it's, it, that one is also there. That one is there. I, 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 I have such a covenant with God. You know, I consciously entered into a covenant with God in 2000 and, 2002, December 2002. So, so I, and I wrote everything down. I still have it. I wrote everything down. What I wanted God to do for me. And then what I also pledge my life to do for God. But it's not like um, we, 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 God is interested, interested in the promise of fools. As the Bible said. So it's not like we don't rush to tell God promise, make, make promise to God. He knows that we are human. And so it's not like he's going to hold it. But there must be things that you have determined to do and you, you must carry them out. So I, I wrote my, what I expect him to do. Then I also wrote what I'm going to do with my life, what I'm going to do with my body, what I have to do with my resources, my talents, and then everything. That, that was, that was the point where I decided, for instance, that I was going to pay more than 10% as tight. It was a personal decision I took that time. I said, I'm going to, I will not, I will never pay 10%. I said, even if it's, I'm paying the time, even if I add one CD to it, if I'm paying tight of 100 CDs, I take 10 CDs. That will be the tight, one at 10%. I make sure I'll add something so that 
it, it will not be 10%. So that was what I was doing. I did that consistently for a very long time. Then in 2012, in 2007, yeah, 2007, I was still doing it. But then the Lord impressed upon me further that now I should make it 20% double. <laughs> not 10 percent 20 percent so when i give tithe any tithe i give is if you look at my tithe you would think that i have money but it's not my it's not my the money i earn if i earn 100 cities 20 cities will go if i get 100 20 will have to go and i've been doing it consistently it's not big it's not the money that god is interested you know and when i had that conviction to go to that. I did it. So in 2012, 2012, was it 2012, 2013, somebody was giving me a prophecy and he said that God said that there's a covenant. He said the devil planned many things, but God says because of a covenant he has with you. And another prophet also told me that God says there's a covenant he has with you. He said you no human being can kill you because there's a covenant you have with God. And even though I had written everything down, I had put it somewhere, and I, my mind didn't go to that covenant. So later on, I was reminded that when I did that, it was a covenant I was entering into with God. And God is faithful. He will be faithful to the covenant. You can enter into a covenant with God. You don't have to promise God. I was telling someone that, don't promise God. Father, I will never do this thing again. Don't, don't say that. <laughs> don't say that. I, I, a friend of mine, when, when he became born again, before he became born again, he was a womanizer. When he became born again, then he said, if I, he said, if he ever sleeps with a woman, God should strike him with epi, uh, leprosy, <laughs> leprosy and some deadly diseases. <laughs> I said, you, you, you were a humanizer <laughs> and you have come to the Lord and you have come to curse yourself. <laughs> but you see, God doesn't take pleasure in those things. You just make an agreement with God. That is what, for instance, let's see that you can even, that's what we call a vow. What I did was a vow, actually. A vow. I'm, I'm going to, I'll vow that I'll, I'll give this to God in service of God. I'll do this. Then God will also, you can have something like that. But there's no greater covenant than the one that we are already under, which is between Jesus and his father, of which we are beneficiaries and we are enjoying. So don't worry yourself with special covenant unless you are led to do that. Yeah. I, uh, Bishop Boy Debu said that he entered into an agreement like that. In fact, I was motivated to do that when I listened to him in 2002, 2001. He said that uh, he wrote a letter to God that he was he wanted to enter into marriage with God. <laughs> you know, because he said in Isaiah 53, he said that your maker can become your husband. So he said, he told his wife, Please, this other time his wife was his fiancee. He said, Please, this is what I've done. The marriage lost meaning to him. He had been in question for some time. He said, Then I, do, I don't want to marry anymore. <laughs> I'm married to the Lord. Then he said that he told the wife that this is what I've just done. I'm, I've sold my life, everything to God. Where what I will eat is what he gives me. Where I will sleep is where he wants me to sleep. Where I will go is where he wants me to go. Then he asked the wife, do you agree? And the woman said, yes. Then he said, please sign. He had written everything on paper and then the woman signed. And he, he, he kept the thing. He still has it. The wife's signature that I will live with you 
just as whatever God and they've been through many things whatever they are still there you know he said when they got married he postponed their honeymoon seven times <laughs> seven times because he was busy with programs <laughs> so he said okay we'll go for honeymoon next week then next week oh oh there's a program because I've already told you that I'm sold out to him so you can't say anything so that is if you want to enter into a covenant you can do that but make sure it's something but at least I have seen that the things I wrote and I asked God for I have seen that God has done all you see God doesn't really bother about the amount of money it's the heart it's the heart and now when you have the how to do something for him he takes notice of that so when he blesses you to you see that all he will, he will bless you in abundance like even beyond what you are you are even able to give sometimes we are stingy because we have not really been delivered because the thing is when god works on your heart and god touches your heart and you fall in love with him there is nothing you cannot give there is nothing you can't give and god wants to deliver us from material attachments so that we can enter into a place where he can bless you with a room like this full of dollars and still your heart will not be on the money you have to be fixed on God. That is the reason why he trains us by asking us to give offering and to pay tithe. They are training. Paying of, payment of tithe and giving of offering, they are just tutorials for, I mean, for little children. Training. Because Idaosa was giving 90% of his money away. And he was living on 10%. Till he died. When he died, at that point he died, he was giving away 90% and living on 10%. And even the 10%, look at the things, the 10% he had. So you can imagine, giving 90% and living. And so such a person, he's not going to argue whether the tithe should pay on the gross or the net. You know, sometimes when, when, the, when the tithe is big, we start uh, questioning, bringing certain questions. Sometimes, when your tithe is small, let's say you, you, you are getting 100 cities, you are taking 10 cities, it's even difficult because 100 cities by 10 cities is what, 90 cities. But you wait till maybe you are getting 100,000 cities. 100,000. Which is uh, 1 billion. And you must take 10,000 as, as tithe. The 10,000 alone, in my case, would be 20,000. 20,000 alone can even buy a car or do something big. But if you can take it and give it to God, it means you have defeated the devil, defeated Mamo, and his grip has been broken over your life. So God will just flow out the resources to you. We always say that God is going to release wealth. It's not going to be released to people who are stingy. It's going to be with these people who can be good stewards. God will check your heart. Whether when he gives you money, you can be a good steward or not. Otherwise, the money itself can destroy you. So you will not just... Because Mammon is a wicked God. Mammon is a spirit. He's a God. He's very wicked. He will not just allow you to get money like that. Unless you have insurance from heaven. He's controlling all the world now. Amen. Okay, any questions? I think, uh, let me take the quest- the assignment. But if you have questions, you can ask. But if you brought the assignment in.
you know, um, it depends on your faith. If your faith tells you that um, you must apply again, and this is exactly what you want, um, then you do it. But you see, the course you you get is determined by your grades. It's determined by your grades. If you put it before, for instance, God can perform a miracle. Okay, but let's say you want to do medicine. But you got aggregate 15. There's no way you can do medicine. There's no way. Unless God performs a miracle, there's no way you can do medicine. So in that case, if if your grade will get you another course, let's say, uh, uh, maybe another course apart from medicine, you don't have to say that, I won't do it. I have to, I'm going to reapply. No, then you have to go and race it. You understand? You have to go and race it, the wasi, and get a single number, single, uh, what do you call it, single digit. Then you can qualify for medicine. On the other hand, if God does a miracle, you can believe God for a miracle, then with your 15, then they take you for medicine without you having to pay bribe or anything. Then that one is a miracle. But you see, sometimes we worry ourselves with these things. These are lesser purposes of God. We have higher themes of God. God's purpose for your life is for you to um, um, be in Christ, number one. Is it for you to spread his influence, bring glory to him, you know. Then he has an assignment for you. For you to locate that assignment is also his purpose for your life. All these things will be means, can be means through which you will fulfill the assignment that God has given you. But they are not the only means. So sometimes people will say that I wanted this school and I didn't get this school, so God has appointed me. No. No. That is not that is that is a lesser purpose. God can mess up the lesser purpose to achieve a higher purpose. Let's say you wanted to go to Achimota, you didn't get Achimota, you were you got to worse, like my, my in my case. I went to Owas, I wanted Achimota I, at that time, common entrance. I think the cutoff point was 260. I got 240 for Achimota 260. And I got 240. But Owas, their cutoff point was 220. And somebody had gotten 230. The father said, I won't let you go because you are young. I had gotten 240. And the father said, Go and replace my son. So from Achimota, I cried, I cried, I ended at Achimota. And I went to us. But I thank God I went to us. I really thank God I went to us. I really, really thank God. <laughs> because a lot of things that has got to my destiny actually was tied, tied to that place. I don't know why, but most of the dreams I've had and all that, they are linked to that place. Which means that God wanted me there, but and I wanted, I wanted Achimota, but my grace didn't allow me. It wasn't God who didn't let me go to Achimota. It was my grace. My mark didn't allow me to go. So we don't, we don't have to. That's not to say that God doesn't have a part to play. You commit your life to God, okay? You wrote your exam. You got this grade. This grade can get you this course. Go and do the course. That doesn't mean that you have you have missed God's plan for your life. God's plan for your life is higher than these are just tools he can use to help you fulfill your plan. Have you not seen people who did one course and ended up practicing another course? Yeah, I mean, somebody uh, can do, I know somebody who did uh, archaeology in our time. Uh, I think he's a, he's He's working with Malcolm also as a manager. Somebody did classics, classic study of uh, Greek uh, mythology and all that classes, and he's 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 working with the Bank of Ghana. So you can do one thing, you may not end up practicing it. So that that is not the only indicator of God's purpose for for our lives. You see. Sometimes, what you will do, your your vocation, let me say your what you will do to be paid, to be paid, some it can also be connected to your purpose. 
not all the time. Sometimes uh, what you are doing is a reflection of your purpose. Like Peter's own. You are a fisherman. Fisherman. You will be a fisher of men. You see. It's, it's, you see that it's connected, but it's, inve- it's, it's not directly, it's not the same, but it has some connection. Okay. So, maybe uh, you are a nurse, a nurse by calling. A nurse by calling. So, maybe you are a spiritual nurse. You see, but if, if, you have an interest in a nursing system, and you are not you have you qualify and you are you don't take an order. Then it means you have to commit it to prayer. Yeah, it means that um, there's a hold up somewhere, you know, and it has to be, it has to be, you have to break through to get it, fight to get it. Yeah, because that may also be connected to God's purpose for your life. It doesn't mean that if you don't get nursing. You are out of God's will. It doesn't mean that. Because number two, it's not only um, this place that you can do nursing. You see, it's not only this place. It's not only at this time. And I don't know whether it's only one avenue to nursing. There are some courses, for instance, law, for instance, that you can do any other course that you can also do law. Sometimes you do a course, you get a certificate or degree or diploma, it boosts your chances of doing some other courses. You see, see. So, and there are always details like you go, don't go straight. You can pass here and get there at the same time. So, I like our advice that you should not be re, uh, very, very worried. Just pray about it. You know, once you qualify and all that. And they must take you. Then you pray about it, you know, and try again. Uh, uh, you 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 get it. But that that doesn't mean that if you don't get nursing, it means that you are out of out of God's will. Maybe God's purpose for your life is maybe higher than the nursing. The nursing is just an indication, a physical indication of what God has called you to do. Maybe God has called you to be a healing evangelist and that may be an indication that and people sometimes see you and they say oh you are a nurse you are a nurse but maybe um, God is saying something deeper something bigger than just a nurse uh, because nurses they attend to physical problems and uh, spiritual nurses to attend to spiritual problems which one do you think is on God's heart <laughs> Which one do you think is on? Both are important, but which one do you think will really be God's purpose for your life? Because God's purpose for your life will always be connected to the body of Christ in a way. If it's not connected to the body of Christ, it can be God's purpose for your life. It could be maybe an, a, a talent God gave you or a natural disposition that God gave you. We all have different talents. Those, ta- those ones are to help us live in this world to earn a living. If you have a talent of singing, you know, if you have a talent of writing, you can decide I will channel it to godly use and to God. But it's supposed to help you. If you're a sportsman, it's not your purpose in life. It's, let me say, your talent. That a sportsman, the a musician, the doctor, the nurse, they all have one purpose. One purpose. To be in Christ to spread his influence, contribute to the building of his body and all that. It's a spiritual purpose, linked to the body of God. But we have different talents and sometimes we have even different assignments by the same purpose. Yeah. Um, let's... I 
Yeah. Oh, the, f- the one is true. Number two, the Hebrew word for covenant is suzerain versa. It's false. Hebrew word for covenant is what? Brit. B apostrophe R I T H. God's three main deals with mankind includes the Davidic covenant. True or false? False, yes. God's final deal with man is the new covenant with his son. True. A suzerain vassal covenant is an agreement between two people or groups who are in the same level or class. False. That one is a parity covenant, not suzerain vassal. The Davidic covenant was not conditioned upon obedience. True or false? It was not conditioned upon obedience. It was not conditioned upon obedience. What it means is that it was not dependent on David's obedience. It's false. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, he said, yeah, the show sh- 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 of David. Uh, yes, you will not take it, but you see, he said that, come to, you know, what the, the how, how the covenant started because of David's heart for God. And David told Nathan that because you have done this, I will also make you a house. And he said, let, let's, let's read, let's read uh, Second Samuel. <laughs> oh, is this a word? Yes. Yes. 89 verse well, 20. Okay. Yeah, he said, I've found my servant David. Uh-huh. With my holy oil, I've anointed him. With whom my hands have been established. Also, my arms have strengthened him. The enemy shall not exert upon him or outwit him. Nor the son of wickedness afflict him. Um, I will beat down his foes before his face. Okay, when you come to verse 28, he says, my mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. Then he said, If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgment, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandment, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with strife. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. But you you you, you see that you see um you see that this one God is talking about. He said, his sure mercy, he will not take his loving kindness from David. Now, it doesn't mean that David cannot break the covenant. He, he cannot, God, there are terms. For instance, wait, wait, I'm coming. <laughs> Come to Second uh, Samuel. I want to show you something. Second Samuel chapter 6. Okay, so verse 5 chapter 7 verse 5 go and tell my servant david that says the lord would you build a house for me to dwell in for i have not dwelt in a house since the time that i brought the children of israel from up egypt okay now um from eight now therefore that's a statement seven with that's the lord i took you from the sheep or fleeing after the sheep to be a lover of my people israel I've been with you wherever you have gone. Okay. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people. Okay. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I'll establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me and I'll establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and shall be my son. 
if he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men. You see, here he was really talking about Jesus, not Solomon. You see, the thing is that um, he said, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. You see, like he was talking about Jesus. It was like one of these things that maybe God is talking about an earthly and uh, a ruler, then the spiritual ruler comes in. So it was about uh, Solomon. But what is I mean that David this this thing that David did, it was because he did something that God also gave him these promises. Which means that no covenant is unconditional. That no matter what you do, even if you break the covenant, if you break the covenant, it, it, it cannot work. <laughs> uh, if they sin. Yes. Yeah, because you see, it's like Abraham. Abraham, God said, I will bless you. I will make your, your, your name great. You know, I will do this. But Abraham... God's covenant with Abraham is still in force now. It's still in force. But it doesn't mean the covenant was not conditioned upon obedience. God was doing all those things because Abraham had been obedient to him. Not because Abraham was just doing anything, anyhow, and then. No, he didn't break the covenant. De- what God said in Psalm, Psalm 18 about David, David didn't break the covenant, his covenant with God. He may have sinned against God and all that, but he didn't break the covenant. So, if the covenant was uh, unconditional, then it, then it meant that that's why it, only the covenant of Jesus Christ was the one that was perfect because he was the only one who could f- fully satisfy the terms of the covenant. All other covenant, God made sure that it was conditioned upon the person's obedience. If you don't obey or you don't fulfill the terms of the covenant, it means it's, it, it's not in force. It doesn't hold. So, uh, it's false. The Davidic covenant was not conditioned upon obedience. The seal of the Abrahamic covenant was the birth of Isaac. True or false? False. Because the seal was circumcision. So, that means that the next question, circumcision was a seal of the Mosaic covenant. False. It's false. The Noah covenant was established right before the flood. False. The rainbow was a sign or the seal of the Noah covenant. True. Then 11. Session B. Uh, it's unfortunate you don't have the lesson notes, but it says the following statements were lifted directly from the lesson notes above, fill, the, fill in the blank spaces. God's final deal with mankind was the covenant he established with Jesus, who was a perfect man. Two major types of covenant in the Bible are human covenants and divine covenants. The covenant God made with Noah happened after the flood. It was a covenant God made with all flesh. If you wrote all um, humanity or all, all mankind, it's correct. All living things, it's correct, yeah. The nature of God's covenant with man in the Old Testament has always been suzerain vassal, not parity. In Bible times, human covenants were also sacred because God or demons were invoked to oversee them. Abrogating human covenants brought death. If the person wrote curses, it's correct, or wrath, or judgment, it's correct. Okay, so now we come. For the following session, read the scriptures assigned to each to the questions and fill the blank spaces accordingly. How many years did how many years old was Noah's father when he gave birth to Noah? 182. Yes, 182 years. What did the father expect the child Noah to bring to them? 
comfort. How many children did Noah have? Three children. So this one, this session is like when you read the scripture, you know the question, the answer to supply. Then you fill the blank space. That's okay. Why did God want to destroy the earth? It was filled with violence. It was filled, according to Genesis 6.13, it was filled with violence. When God told Noah of the impending destruction, how did Noah react? He moved with fear. He moved with fear. Or you can say he moved with godly fear. It's also correct. Um, number 21. Of the four classes of creatures God made, that is in Genesis 1 26, which ones were excluded from the destruction of the flood? Genesis 6 7. The fish of the sea. Genesis 6 7. If, someone, if the person wrote the um, sea creatures, it's correct. Reptiles, no. <laughs> no, not reptile. See, see, those in the sea. Uh huh. Okay. Twenty-two. Which two classes of creatures are not represented before God by the four living creatures? Revelation four seven. Who two classes of creatures are not represented before God by the four living creatures, the sea creatures and the creeping things? Yeah. When you look at the four living creatures, we have the lion, the eagle, the ox, and the man representing lion representing the animals in the the beast, the wild beast, the ox representing the cattle, the eagle representing the birds, then man representing mankind. But if you look at Genesis one twenty six, we have that those that creep and those are in the sea, they are not presented before God in the four living creatures. Why did God command Noah to take two of two of each kind of animal, male and female, to keep them alive for a production? Yeah. For a production too is correct. Keep them alive is correct. Yeah. According to the script the, the, the scripture reference, according to Genesis six twenty, that's what he said. To keep them alive, yeah. And uh, if you if you read Genesis six twenty, sometimes some of the questions you realize that if you look directly into the Bible, you you will see that the answer is direct. Direct. You see, it says, of the birds after their kinds, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. So the person who wrote that is correct. But we know that the reason why it's male and female was for them to reproduce afterwards. But according to the scripture, he also said to keep them alive. So then um, 24, you were saying something. Recreate <laughs> <laughs> 24 give the exact date for the start of the flood in today's calendar system <laughs> today's calendar is 17 February 17 February 600 no <laughs> okay let's look at the scripture Genesis 7 11 Genesis seven eleven. I said the, uh, the the question is in today's calendar system. So Genesis seven eleven said that in the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month. You see, so second month in today's system will be February. Seventeen day will be seventeen February, and he added six hundred years. Ah, uh, okay. He he he. he 600th year. Yeah, no, it was his, his age all right, but he said in the 600th year of Noah's life. So maybe he was trying to replace 
maybe maybe 17th February 1994 or but you, you can't write something by 600 so it's 17th February but mark the person just cancel 600 and mark the person because at least no no it's not wrong at least at least he read the scripture I was able to see the 17th February uh huh that that one was excess information he was he was giving the marker <laughs> Additional knowledge was given to Micah. Exactly how many months did it take for the ark to rest on the mountains of Ararat? If you calculate, how many months? Five months. How many windows did the did Noah's ark have? One. How many floors did the ark have? Three floors. Give the exact day and month Noah went out of the ark. 27th February. Okay. So, okay. 27th February. So, 17th February, 27th February, that you went after that, the following year. How long did the whole thing last? One year, 10 days. <laughs> yeah, the whole thing, like from start to the, the time the waters receded and the time they came out, you know, one year, ten days exactly. No, no. this one we say give the exact. How long did the whole thing? It's like specific. One year, ten days. The, the person didn't do calculation. <laughs> it was a lazy work. What was the sign of the covenant God made with all the earth? The rainbow. The rainbow. That's okay. So every mark, every correct answer is one mark. So that will make it how many? Ten plus fifteen, which is ten, five, fifteen. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 32 marks. Every correct answer. So, number 24, for instance, the exact date, the seven, if, if it is, um, that it may be the 7th or 17th of February, 17th is one mark. February is one mark. Every correct answer gets one mark. Every correct space, like answer in a space. You understand? Yeah, every correct answer in a space will get one mark. You see that these this, um, questions, some of them, most of them are designed to Designed to force you to read, force you to read. That's why I call them reinforcements. They are, they just reinforce the lessons that were taught. So you will be forced to go to the the, the Bible and read something. 